Good morning, everyone. Welcome to church. We're so glad that you chose to be here this morning. We're gonna sing some songs, so why don't you stand and put your hands together and sing this out with us. Sunday morning. We're so excited you're here. I'm Teresa Arndt, and I'm just glad to worship Jesus with you this morning. Whether you're in the room or watching online from home, thanks for joining us today. I want to invite you, if you are in the room, especially to open up your phones. You should, we used to tell you to put your phones away and silence them. Now we're like, bring them on out. We want you to open up that Bible app, that version Bible app. And when you open that up, there's a way for you to connect with us through that major app. And if you open it up on the bottom right-hand corner, these three little bars there, you click on that. That's the more button. And once you click on that, you click on events. 
the word events. And then events opens you up to an opportunity to click on East Point Live. And you click on that, and then you are in the know. That app allows you to have message outline, message notes, take notes, save it for later. There's an opportunity for you to see all the things that we have going on here at East Point and even sign up and register for things. And you can give prayer requests. You can let us know how we can pray for you, and we can be partnering with you in prayer. So lots of good things there, but I just wanted to highlight a couple of things. Today, we have no less than, but I know we actually have more than, 12 people signed up, but more will be back baptized today at one o'clock. I know. Isn't that exciting? Um, one o'clock at Kiwanis Park. If you just put in Kiwanis Park and Google, and they will take you straight there. And then we'll have people there in the parking lot kind of directing you our direction. We'll bring your own lunch, bring a lawn chair, and then we will eat and then gather together for some more singing and celebrating people who are choosing to make a public declaration of their faith in Jesus. So that's going to be exciting. I have uh, several groups, several opportunities this fall coming up for you guys to take some classes and get involved. We have Financial Peace University to help with your finances. We have a divorce care. If you've encountered a divorce or someone you know, we also have a Marriage on the Rock to enrich your marriage. But I cannot stand up here and do justice to all these classes when we have so much happening. So here's what I'm going to ask you guys to do. If you haven't already, and if you're watching online, I want you to do this too. If you haven't already liked our our Facebook page, East Point Church Facebook page, or our Instagram, please do so, because we have all of the things that we talk about on Sunday morning show up on Instagram and Facebook. And you know what the best part about that is? You get to share it. So not only are we announcing it for here, but you get to share it with your friends that we have all these opportunities and classes, because you don't have to attend East Point to go to some of these things. So you are a great publicity for us as well and helping us market. So be sure to like those Facebook page and Instagram so that those upcoming announcements that we have about the classes, you can help pass and share the word. And then Wednesday is our Youth End of Summer Bash. They're catering Chipotle and they're going to have a big blow up jousting ring where they get to beat each other up but not hurt anybody. So that's going to be fun. So if you have a middle schooler or high schooler, make sure you get them here. Um, doors open at 6.15, I believe, but they starts at 6.30 and you won't want to miss that for them. And then women, lastly, I've mentioned this before, but want to mention it again. On the back counter, we have these little flyers for a save the date for our women's retreat that's coming up November 5th through 7th. The cost, just so you know how much to start saving so that when we register, you're, you're not surprised and you can be preparing now for that. Sound good? Thank you. I feel like I'm so alone up here. Well, now, as we do uh, every week, we turn our attention um, to the tithes and offering of giving to East Point. And we do that through text. You can do it through uh, the YouVersion Bible app. You can do it by placing your offering in the back boxes on your way out. And I try to like to encourage what your money goes toward. And today, I just want to remind you, Jesus himself said, let the little children come to me, right? Jesus did not want to hinder any child having an encounter with himself. And because of your finances, did you know there's a good handful of kids back there that are being helped finding and following Jesus this week? And we do that, and we can do that because your resources help us get the resources of curriculum and supplies that we need to give them the encounters to help them find and follow Jesus at such a young age. So thank you for giving so that we can encounter and help uh, reach the next generation. That's a blessing to them and their families as well. Well, we're going to invite you to stand. We're going to sing some more songs. You know how when you go into the grocery store or some of those the mall, there's always music playing? There's always like happy music playing and you just kind of feel good. And they, you know, their intent is, I want you to buy more because if you feel good, you buy more. And that's the intent of music. Music has that impression on our hearts. And I don't know about you, but culture, there's some storms in culture happening right now. There's some storms in my life happening right now. And do you know what the Bible says about praise and worship? It's a way we battle the storms. It's the way we rise above the storms. And the best way to do that is to focus our attention on the one who is above the storms and the one who controls the storms. So we're going to do that today as we sing, let's raise a hallelujah to the things that Jesus is doing in your life and the things he will continue to do in spite of what's going on around you. Let's stand and sing. I raise 
There's nobody like you, God. There's nobody like you, God. And there will never be.
God, we love you and we praise you this morning because you are high and above all things, Lord. You are worthy of all of our praise. Thank you, Lord, that even though you are a big and mighty God, you draw close to us and you meet us where we're at. Thank you, Lord, that we get to know you, that we get to sing to you, and that we get to be here together. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for singing with us this morning. You can go ahead and take a seat. Epic students, you are dismissed. And everyone, please join me in welcoming Pastor Kurt. Good morning, guys. Thank you. Thank you for being a part of our service today. Whether you're here or online, welcome to East Point. Um, I'm going to cover a couple things before we jump into the um, actual talk. We'll be in Revelation chapter 19 this morning. But we'll get there in just a minute. Before I do, though, uh, I need to just address a couple of things. Uh, one of them being mask. Uh, I know just using that word in public, using it anywhere, creates a lot of uh, interesting responses, slash reactions, slash whatever you want from a lot of people. And uh, I, I get it. I understand. Um, it's been a year and a half, and we have struggled through a lot of things. We mean our culture, uh, the church. Uh, you know, a year and a half ago, we were probably 40, 50 percent larger than we are today in terms of attendance. And there's a lot of people that I have not seen for a year and a half. They just, and whether they're ever coming back, I don't know. As a pastor, that's difficult, that's challenging for me, it breaks my heart. Uh, we're not about numbers, we're not about crowds, but we are about people. And I love people and I care about people and I just, it's been a challenge. I've never in all of my life seen uh, our culture as polarized as it has been in this last 18 months or so. And it's not getting really any better. Uh, I, and that's saying a lot, because guys, I lived through the 60s, man. I, and the Vietnam War and the polarization that happened then, and some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. Some of you are like, yep, I know, I was there. So it's, it's a, this is a difficult and challenging time for all of us. And so when I um, bring up the issue of mask, I need you to understand where I'm at, where I, where I land. I'm going to do my best not to give you opinion. What I want to tell you is where we're at, where, where we stand on this. We believe uh, in adult-to-adult -adult relationships. I believe that you are the best one to choose what's best for you. And I also believe that Jesus is your only Lord and Master, and that you need to listen to Jesus, that you need to pay attention to what he asks you to do. And I'm not your master. Thank the Lord I'm not your master. And, and you get to listen to him and follow him. If, by the way, if you don't follow my blog, this is not a self-promotion. I write at least once a week at KurtBubna.com, and I just wrote this last week. KurtBubna.com, go follow me. And I wrote about this whole issue of vaccinations and masks, and I covered it at length, and it'll take you five minutes to read it, but it'll be right there for you. And and you'll see my position on all of this pretty clearly. But here's where I'm at. <clears throat> we are in a season where there's been an uptick. No matter what you believe about masks, COVID, vaccinations, uh, absolutely there's been an increase. Uh, I've talked to Nick, who's a nurse that uh, goes to our church, who works at, at uh, ER, Sacred Heart. He said, I see some more case, COVID cases in the last two weeks than he's seen in the, in the last year. Uh, my aunt and uncle who live in Pulse Falls, they're suffering from COVID, and my uncle's got pneumonia. I've got a friend of mine who's much younger than me who's in the hospital right now. For a week, he's been on a ventilator, and it's COVID-related pneumonia. So this is a real thing. I have said this all along. I have never, ever, ever just poo-pooed this as I, whatever. The issues that are related to this are a multitude and many, and everybody in this room has an opinion. If you're watching in line, you've got an opinion. I get that. I understand that. Here's what breaks my heart. I expect our culture to be polarized and, and ugly with each other. I, I don't expect the church to be that way. And it, it, it truly breaks my heart when I see Christians ragging on Christians, when I see Christians mistreating Christians, when I see people that are, are being harsh. I mean, no matter where you land, whether you're in a mask 24-7 or, you know, over your dead body, you'll ever wear one again. Wherever you're at on that spectrum, you, listen, you don't have the right to mistreat anybody ever. Ever. Jesus never did so. You don't get to treat people poorly. You don't get to be mean and unkind to them. That's just not the heart of Jesus. And so our responsibility is to treat one another with love. The great command is still the great command. Love God, love people. It always has been. It always will be. That's the great commandment. Love God, love people. And we just need to do that and do that really, really well. Now I've asked the staff to model wearing masks while, while we're under this mask mandate. Uh, I'm encouraging compliance, but I am not going to police it. It ain't my job to do so. I just can't. I'm not. Go to Fred Meyer. They're not policing it. And again, you have options available to you. You can watch online. I've never shamed anybody. 
You can space yourself out as far as you want here. You can, we, if you, somebody wants it, we'll, we'll bring, bring back the mask only room, which we never had anybody ever use, but we'll provide whatever you want, we'll do to support you in your decision about what you believe is best for you. Are you catching my drift? Now, in the midst of that, though, please, I'm begging you. I'm challenging you. I'm, I am speaking to you as a pastor in the body of Christ. You don't get to shame people. You don't get to mistreat people. Please don't look at somebody that wears a mask or doesn't wear a mask and, and treat them poorly. Here's what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 14, verse 19. I'm going to have it on the screen because I want you guys to see it as well as here. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and the mutual edification. Let us do, let us therefore make every effort. What's the therefore, therefore? Well, in this chapter, Paul is dealing with the church in Rome where there's a lot of division and dissension about whether you should eat kosher or not, or drink or not. And there's, believe it or not, for about 2,000 years, people have been arguing in the church. What a shock. And they had issues in Rome. And Paul says, guys, here's the deal. And he says it. You go read the passage. He says, you don't get to be someone else's master. You don't get to tell somebody. They don't answer to you. Now, this is a Bubna paraphrase version. It's coming out in 2048. I'll be dead, but that's when it's going to come out. But here's the deal. You, you are not their master. Paul says that you are not, you are not, you are not. And here's what Paul says we must do. We must, therefore, make every effort to do what leads to peace. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. Be that person. Be that guy where you work, where you live, in your family. I know no families have any arguments about this. <clears throat> Please don't be the, the, the one who's the source of conflict. Be the one who brings peace in the midst of it. Are you hearing my heart? Yes. Three of you hear it? Thank you very much for that. I, I'm, I'm begging you guys. It breaks my heart when we see people who are mistreated and, and we cannot do that anymore. One more thing before I jump into the text. Uh, here's a personal challenge. If you've not yet been baptized in water, today's the day. If you're a Christ follower and you've not been baptized in water as a public declaration of your faith in Christ, the Bible says in Mark 16, 16, repent and be baptized. When uh, Peter preached his first sermon and people said, what do we do? He says, repent and be baptized. Jesus got baptized. Jesus gave us the great commission, which is to go into all the world, preach the gospel, and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Water baptism is an outward sign of some, an inward reality of what God has done in your heart. We don't make you walk down front. We don't single you out when you make a decision here at East Point when you become a Christ follower. We make it pretty easy for you to make that decision. But this is your public declaration. Yep, I belong to Jesus. Yep, I love him. Yep, I'm, I've surrendered my life to him. And so today, uh, it's 20 minutes down the road. 20 minutes. And by the way, Post Falls doesn't have a mask mandate. I'm just saying. So 20 minutes down the road, Kiwanis Park, it's beautiful. It's going to be a great day. We're going to gather down there, have a meal together, and then walk down the river, have some worship, and, we're, and, and uh, baptize people. And if you've not been baptized, today's the day. So well, I need to pray about it. No, you don't. You don't. You never have to pray about what the Bible tells you to do. Just do it, and it's time. Okay? Or not. It's an outward sign of inward reality, and I'm going to encourage you to do that today. All right. End of pre-message number one and two. Here's the real message. <clears throat> Teresa did an incredible job last week. If you missed it, uh, I gave her the really easy topic of talking about the wrath of God. Yeah, and uh, she did a phenomenal job. I mean, incredible job. One of the things she said, I'm just going to quote her. She says, I love it. the loving and just God cannot look the other way regarding sin. The perfect and final reign of God demands judgment of those who refuse, key word, those who refuse to embrace his rule, his grace. His sin requires payment. But God, in his grace, provided a way to escape his coming wrath. God provided a way. And that's what we need to land on. And that's what we're going to talk a little about today. But we'll be in part six of our series, The End of the World as We Know It. We'll be in Revelation 19. Next Sunday, I know it's Labor Day weekend, but if you're in town or if you uh, can watch it online, we're going to finish up the series and talk about the new heaven and new earth. And it's going to be awesome. It's going to be fun. We're going to finish the last three chapters of Revelation. But this morning, we're going to focus on Revelation 19. In Revelation 17 and 18, it uh, primarily deals with the fall of Babylon. What's the fall of Babylon? Well, some believe it's a literal city rebuilt on the Euphrates River. Possible. They take that passage literally. Others believe it's a revived Roman Empire, and that's a possibility. Many, including me, believe it symbolically refers to an evil world system where the Antichrist 
and his minions will control, and it'll be an evil world system that is coming. And I think if we've ever wondered whether that's possible, we can sure see how that's possible now, huh? I really think, yeah, wow, it's scary possible. But regardless of where you land on this issue, whether you think it's literal or not, or wherever you think it is, here's the bottom line. And I always love landing on the absolutes. Here's the absolute. It gets destroyed. Whatever it is, it gets destroyed by God's judgment, and it, it gets destroyed for its moral and spiritual decadence. So chapter 19 begins with heaven rejoicing over the defeat of Babylon, over the defeat of evil, and it ends with Jesus' second coming. It's incredible. At, and it, the, at, in, at the uh, second coming at the end of the tribulation. Chapter 19 also deals with something called the wedding supper of the Lamb. Now, that's not a phrase that you like ever use in conversation. I don't think anybody this last week, hey, man, how was that wedding supper of the Lamb? How'd that go for you? We don't talk about that. It's kind of a weird phrase. But for the Hebrews, for the Jews that read this, uh, when John wrote it, they would have understood it very well. But this chapter deals with that. It deals with the defeat of the Antichrist, the false prophet, the final battle, the battle of Armageddon, uh, which marks the end of the tribulation. You can find that in Revelation 16, 16, or Revelation 17, 13 through 14. And I'm, I'm, I'm kind of going through this because I just, hopefully you've been following the homework assignment to read this on your own. You've been reading through the Revelation. I hope you've read it by now five or six or seven or 10 times. And you're like, oh yeah, yeah, that's what it's talking about. Great. Well, as Teresa again said last week, that we need to understand that God's wrath is not a temper tantrum. He's, his, he's not just having a fit, and, and his, but his judgment is, in fact, just. It's just because those who reject and refuse him, meaning those who reject his free gift of salvation, will ultimately experience his very righteous wrath. And God has given everyone so many opportunities to respond to him. But I, I love this phrase, great, uh, God's wrath stands against those who stand against him. God's wrath stands against those who stand against him. So the moral to that story is don't stand against God. We need to remember though that people choose their path. Teresa talked about that. I'm reminding you that this week. We choose. I'm going to talk about two suppers in Revelation 19. One of them is the great supper, the wedding supper of the Lamb. You want to be a part of that one. The other one is where people are the supper. And it's gruesome. It gross gruesome. I just made up a word. It's gruesome. And you're not going to want to be a part of that one. But uh, the group that partakes in this great supper of the Lamb is something that I want us to focus on today. But here's what I want you to walk away with. It's the big idea in your outline. Because Jesus loves us as a groom loves his bride, we can look forward to a day of celebration with him. I don't want you to leave here today depressed, scared, terrified. I want you to leave here rejoicing that because God loves us, because Jesus loves his bride, that's us the church. Because he loves us, we can look forward to a day of celebration. I've mentioned this every week. The church in Asia Minor, modern day Turkey, was suffering a great deal. When John wrote this to them, they were suffering some martyrdom, persecution for their faith. And John's encouraging them. One of the great goals of the book of Revelation is to remind people, hey, listen, it doesn't matter how tough it is right now. Right now is not the end of the story. Let me make a personal application to you. It doesn't matter how tough it is right now in your life what we're facing as a culture, as a, as a planet, as a world. It, 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 of course, it's hard, but we win. The ultimate victory that we have is in Christ, and that's what we need to focus on. So we're going to talk about the, uh, the love that groom has for the bride. In fact, to set the tone, I'm going to show you this picture. I, I have no idea who that guy is standing next to my wife. <laughs> but that's me and my lovely bride. Uh, many, 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 many. I was 18 years old. Yes, I was young. And uh, lots of people thought we'd never make it because they knew me and they were probably more shocked uh, that we did. But we just celebrated in July our 46th wedding anniversary. Yeah. And I know some of you thinking, I'm not even that old. Yeah, I know, get over it. Um, but a long time ago, I remember that day. I remember the details of it. I really do. I remember the anticipation and the nervousness I had. Uh, I remember how I felt as the doors of the auditorium were closed. And my wife stood there with her uh, dad at the back. And uh, they opened the doors, and she walked in. They closed the doors, and I walked, watched her walk down the aisle. Uh, I remember um, messing up the words as we went through the ring ceremony. I said, with this wing, I the red. I really did. With this wing, I the red. And everybody kind of chuckled throughout. About 300 people were there, and they all thought it was cute. And I, didn't even, I, had no, I didn't even know what I said, but I literally said that. But more than anything, I remember the longing I had in my heart for her, the love that I, I felt for, for my, my bride. And here's what I want you to think about with me. Listen, let this sink in deeply. Jesus longs for you. He loves you. 
more than any groom ever loved any bride. When Jesus looks at you, even though he sees that you're far from perfect and there is no such thing as a perfect bride, he, he knows that he loves you and he loves you. He longs for you and his love for you goes beyond description. It defies explanation. It baffles us, it surprises us. It is a love for a groom, for his bride. And that great day of celebration is coming where we're gonna celebrate a feast at the wedding supper of the Lamb. Let's read about it. Revelation chapter 19, pick it up, verse 1. Revelation 19, 1. After this, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for true and just are his judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants, and that's those who were martyred for their faith, especially those martyred for their faith during the tribulation. Verse 3, and again they shouted, Hallelujah, the smoke from her, from Babylon, goes up forever and ever. Verse 4, the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God, who was seated on the throne. And they cried out, Amen, Hallelujah. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, both great and small. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. By the way, here's a little tidbit of information that you may or may not know. We use the word hallelujah, we, lots of different songs and Christians, it's kind of a christian East term what we use. But this is the only place in the New Testament that it's used. And it's used four times in one chapter. Four times it's used here. Hallelujah it means praise the Lord or glory to God. And it's used as a bold declaration of reverence and honor to him. And it's used four times. And quickly, i just give you the, the context of the references uh, for hallelujah. The first two, the, hallelujah, the first one was for God's enemies are defeated. So a great multitude shouts hallelujah. God, we win. The second is verse 3, the victory is permanent. The, the uh, significance of the smoke rising up from Babylon is that there's a permanence to God's victory. And it's going to be forever and ever from that point on. Verse 4, uh, the hallelujah is from the 24 elders and all who uh, are there gathered, uh, kneeling down before the throne. And it's there that we're singing hallelujah, shouting hallelujah to God who is sovereign over all. And verse 5 to 7 is where great or small, all believers are in community. Notice there, I love this, great or small, all believers are in community, worshiping God together. In fact, at a deafening le level. Louder than you can possibly imagine. Louder than you've ever experienced, probably in any concert or any church worship service on the planet. Every tribe, every nation, people from all ages are going to shout, Hallelujah! For our Lord God Almighty reigns. In fact, I want to just put that up on the screen. And if you've got a little baby, cover her or his or her ears. Because we're going to shout this. I, I want you guys to shout this with me. Let's just practice. One, two, three. Hallelujah! For our Lord God Almighty reigns. All right, that was okay. It's going to be a lot louder than that. And you won't be able to hold yourself back. It's going to be this, this, this declaration, this screaming. I have been to uh, Victoria Falls in Zambia. Uh, maybe some of you have been to Niagara Falls. My wife's been there. And the sound of that, the water, is deafening. It just, it's unbelievable. It just, it's like everywhere. And that's what we're going to experience someday in heaven with God. 1988, um, I had the privilege of being at the Dodger, uh, Dodger Stadium for one of the greatest moments in baseball history. Now, if you're a baseball fan, you're going to know what this moment is. But uh, it was a World Series game with the Oakland A's. And the Dodgers were losing by one run in the bottom of the ninth. Um, and they had one man on base, and Kirk Gibson came up. And he came up limping. He was injured, and uh, he was down 3-2. Three, 3-2, two. Three, two, a, a count against him. And if you don't know what that means, you don't know anything about baseball, but that's okay, because here's the point. He knocked it out of the stinking park. I mean, out into the bleachers. And I'm there with my son, my oldest son, and my nephew, and my brother-in-law. The four of us were sitting together in the bleachers. And I, I can hardly describe to you. We screamed. I was hoarse for days. I'm throwing my son up in the air. And, and he was like nine or whatever. And it's like we were just, we went on and on. Gibson just hobbled around the bases. And then he went down the, the bleachers like, it's no, no, really, no, no, no big, no, it's fine, it's fine. And then people scrambled. He came out again. And we went on and on. Here's the deal. That was for baseball. Can you imagine what it's going to be like when we are in the presence of the Lord God Almighty forever and ever, and we're there with the, the Lamb who was slain for our sins, and, is, and, and everyone 
from every tribe, every nation, every color, every age. Everybody's going to be there worshiping God, shouting hallelujah. I'm looking forward to that day, and that's what we can look forward to as well. But I want you today to look with me at the two feasts that are described here in Revelation 19. And uh, one of them's awesome, you want to be a part of. The second one's not so awesome, it's horrible, you don't want to be a part of it. Number one, a feast of great joy. A feast of great joy. Revelation 19, let's read on, verse 7 to 10. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. So John describes what it is and what it means. I'll come back to that. Verse 9, then the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. At this, I fell at his feet to worship him. Now he's worship, he's fallen at the feet of an angel. And the angel said, no, 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 no. But he said to me, don't do that. I'm a fellow servant with you, with your brother and sisters who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for it is the spirit of prophecy who bears testimony to Jesus. Now in verse 9, there's, there's that phrase, the wedding supper of the Lamb. And it's, again, not a familiar phrase for us. But to every Hebrew who would have read that, they would have known exactly what John was referring to. Basically, there are four parts to a Jewish wedding, and I'll cover them real quickly, but it's kind of fun to understand what's happening here. There's the betrothal, betrothal, which is usually happened, could have happened when they were children, but usually about a year before a wedding, the bride was betrothed to the groom, and it would have been sealed with a ring or a bracelet, a promise ring. And then uh, at some point, there would be the presentation of the bridal procession, and that's where they would go and get the bride, and they would come with singing and dancing and all sorts of merriment and bring her to the home of the groom's home where the ceremony was going to take place, but then there would be some pre-ceremony festivities that could last for days. Then there was a ceremony, which usually is pretty simple, exchanging of vows, and the bride's veil would be removed, and the veil would be placed on the uh, bridegroom's shoulder. But then following that, there was the wedding supper. And that was the final celebration feast that usually lasted anywhere from three to seven days. I've said this before, the Jews know how to party. And uh, you just see this here. I mean, there's a, this, the event was not just a one moment, but it was just this sequence of events that took place and it ended with this wedding supper. So the idea here, and what John's painting for us is this picture of, of rejoicing, this glad rejoicing that's supposed to happen when we're with Jesus forever. John uses the image of the wedding feast to encourage us to hold on. Again, the Christians are being persecuted, martyred for their faith in Asia Minor. The letter that this went to, those people were suffering a great deal. And John is trying to encourage them as I want to encourage you today. Hold on. The day's coming. No matter what you're going through now, a better day is coming. Whatever you're dealing with now, don't put a period there. It's a comma because there's a great wedding supper of the Lamb that's coming in the end. It also reminds us, though, this passage reminds us of the intensity and the depth of God's love, his Jesus' desire and love for us. He loves us as a groom loves his bride. And so here's the question. You know, I'm all about application here at East Point. Here's the question. So what? What is a reasonable response then of us, of the, of, the, of the bride, to the groom? What's our part in the celebration? Well, look at Revelation 19, 7 and 8. Verse 7 says, let us rejoice and be glad. Part of our response is to party, to rejoice and be glad. And then to give him glory, to give God glory, to thank God for what he's done. And then he goes on, and for the wedding of the Lamb has come, his bride has made herself ready. I love that phrase. And most of us uh, know this, or you've experienced this, that, that uh, when a bride's getting ready for a wedding, does she take, take a few minutes, two, five, six, seven, eight, ten minutes getting ready for the wedding ceremony, or is it like days, maybe weeks? I mean, when I, here's the thing. I have never seen an ugly bride. I have, I have done a lot of weddings. I have officiated a, a, well over 100 weddings, and I've never seen an ugly bride. And every bride that I've ever known and been around, they start preparing weeks, months in advance before the ceremony. And then the day of the ceremony, I mean, from the moment they wake up, they're doing their hair and their makeup and the jewelries and all sorts of things there. They spend hours getting ready for, you know, when I officiate, I always tell the bride and groom, now, okay, I'd love to do this for you, but the ceremony is probably going to last about 20 to 30 minutes. Okay, that's fine. But, I think it's, but all of this, weeks sometimes, an entire day spent in preparation for this moment, this moment of celebration. His bride made herself ready. What does that mean for us? 
It means that there are things that we can do. We rejoice, we're glad. But he talks about here that the fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's people. Now, here's what you need to know. Uh, we don't do these righteous acts to earn anything from the groom. No bride gets beautiful hoping that when the groom shows up, he finally loves her. Oh man, I really hope that I look good. But it really, really suck if he showed up and walks down the aisle and says, nope, you're really not. Ah. Now that would be terrible. No, that's no bride ever stresses about whether she will be loved or not. She is, because she's loved, responding to that love by wanting to look her absolute best and to be prepared. And the letter here in Revelation is challenging, encouraging us to be prepared. And we don't do these acts to earn anything. The bride is dressed in fine linen. It's these righteous acts, these deeds, these actions of God's holy people. They're not acts to earn God's righteousness. They're in response to his given love for us. The practical results of what he's done for us. So, they're acts of love. They're a response to the love we already have from the groom. And why do I bring that up? I grew up in a church where pretty much you had to do all the right things to make sure you were in the right place so that you could be loved by an angry God. And that is not truth. That is not the way it is. We are to do things. What you do does matter. But why you do it matters more. Are you listening to me? You ought to do works of righteousness. You ought to serve others and serve God. You need to do things that are a demonstration of the love that you have already have from him. Righteous acts of God's holy people are acts of servanthood and sacrifice. They're acts of love for Jesus and for others. It's that outward manifestation of an inward reality. It's like water baptism. Because Jesus loves us. Because he loves you. You prepare for his coming by doing good works, good acts of service for others out of love. This week, here's your challenge. When you go and you have to work with somebody that's really hard to love, find a way to serve them. When you go home or, you know, your kid or your spouse or your whatever, your BFF says something or does something really not so good, or you're having a hard time, it's just like, I really wish you just would be easier to love. It's in that moment that you find a way to serve them. Find a way to sacrifice for them. Not to earn from them, not because they deserve it, but because of love. Just simply because of love. We serve. We give. We sacrifice. Because of what God has done for us. It's in contrast to the great prostitute Babylon, who corrupted, seduced, and destroyed people with her depraved morality and self-serving acts. The church, the bride of Christ, on the other hand, proves herself proves her love for the groom by good works done in love for the honor and glory of God. So go, do things this week. Love others because Jesus loves you. The cool part is, and we get to celebrate that day's coming. We're going to celebrate in the wedding supper of the Lamb. That's the first feast, the second feast. And I won't spend a lot of time on this because it's not really pleasant. But the second one is the feast of great tragedy. A feast of great tragedy. Look at Revelation 19, verse 11. John says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him. Those, that's, that army is composed of all believers. Riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth, this is Jesus, out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, those who are opposed to him. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has his name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Verse 17. And I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried out in a loud voice to all the birds flying at midair. And here's where it gets kind of gruesome. Come, gather together for the great supper of God. This is not the feast of the wedding supper of the Lamb. This is, this is the one you don't want to be a part of. Come, gather together for the great supper of God so that you may eat the flesh of the kings, generals, and the mighty of horses and their riders and the flesh of all people, free and slave, great and small. Verse 21, the rest were killed with a sword coming out of the mouth of the rider of, on the horse, and all the birds gorge themselves on their flesh. That's the supper you don't want to be a part of. This picture here is Jesus changing from the groom who loves the bride to Jesus, the warrior king. 
the warrior king. The image of him on a white horse shows his incredible and ultimate authority. And in John's time, this white animal would have been something that a white horse was a, what a Roman general would ride on after victory. And I love in verse 14 that the armies of heaven are showing up on white horses as well. We are the victors in this as well. And the sword out of his mouth is mentioned, I think, like five or six times in Revelation. Two times right here, verse 15 and verse 31. But that sword coming out of his mouth is the, the, the word of God, and the enemy will be destroyed by the army of Jesus and by the word of Jesus. And again, the imagery of the angel calling birds to gather to a great feast is gruesome. I will admit that to you. And it paints a picture of a reality we cannot ignore. The end for those who reject God and fight against him will not be pretty. And I hope you don't rejoice in that. I don't know, well, it's about time they get what's coming to them. No, it ought to break your heart. I, there have been times in my life, I don't know how many times, where I wake up in the middle of the night and I'm, and I'm crying, I'm wailing about friends and family members who I know are yet, have yet to, to respond to the love of Jesus. And it breaks my heart. It ought to break your heart. We ought to cry out, oh God, please, I want everyone I know to be a part of that wedding supper of the Lamb, not to be the supper, not to be defeated in the end. The first feast shows the longing of God to be with his bride, with his people. The second feast brings God's final judgment to all who reject his offer of grace and salvation. One of my worst nightmares, I'm about to date myself, but as a kid, um, I watched Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds. Now, all the old people know, though, but that was black and white. It came out in 1963. I said I was at a friend's house. I don't know how old I was. And it, I, I, I still have nightmares about it. I still see the person running into the phone booth. You know what those are? Running into the phone booth to get away from the birds. It's a horrible. They, they did a remake in 94, and for some reason I watched it. What well, I think it was 94. Watched it again. It's terrible. It's a terrible, terrible image of the bird. And to this day, I, I, I worry about every bird that flies by me. You know, it's like, I just, I'm, I'm a little cautious. But here's the point. This image is not meant to terrify anybody. Here's why. Fear, like guilt, is a lousy motivator. It doesn't work. At least not very long. Again, the church I grew up in was really good at using guilt. And for about a day, or as long as I was around somebody who cared, I was good. But as soon as I wasn't, I was not good. Guilt does not work as a motivator. And a terrifying you is not what I'm trying to do here. But this image reminds us what is at stake, what's involved here. God's desire for you and me is intimacy. It is undeniable that he, he wants to love you like a groom loves the bride. His love is so extreme and so unbelievable that he sent his one and only son to die for you and me so that we could be restored to relationship with him. The entire Bible is a progressive story of God's desire to be in relationship with you and me. And you've got to know that he loves you and he wants to be in relationship with you. And that's what I want you to hear today. And that's why we are here to be lights in the midst of darkness and remind people, hey, there's good news. Uh, yeah, there's bad news. Good news wouldn't be good news without bad news. You understand that, right? Bad news is there's judgment or wrath coming, but the good news is you don't have to, do, you don't have to go there. You can choose life. You know, I was recently at a wedding. I did not officiate at this wedding. Uh, it was a beautiful location, um, outdoor wedding. It was a gorgeous evening. And uh, I was there, part of the crowd, and the people go to our church. It was, it was just fun. And I have done this thing. You're going to start doing this now because you're going to remember, oh, Bubna does that. I'm going to try it out. But I, whether I'm officiating or attending, I've always done this at weddings. I always take a sneak peek of the groom. Now, the bride is walking down, you know, and she's looking good and and, and everybody's like, whoa, look at that beautiful dress, or oh my goodness, you know. And sometimes I go, wow, I wish she had more clothes on than that. But, you know, hey, I'm a pastor has to stand there in front of these people sometimes. It's like, really? Come on. But yeah, that's, I, I digress. So sorry. Yeah. Where was I? Oh, I'm saying, so here's what I like to do, though. I, re I really do. I love to get a sneak peek of the groom. And I'm at this wedding, and everybody's watching her. She was beautiful, gorgeous. And, and, and they're all looking at her, and I turn, and I just take, take a look at the guy. I just want to take a sneak peek, just for a moment, of the groom. And every time, every time, there's this glow. The groom is elated, excited, thrilled. Just can hardly, I can't find a word to describe the way the groom feels about the bride. Listen to me. Listen. <laughs> That's the way Jesus feels about you. When he looks at you, he's not ticked off. He's not, oh man, if you would just, I wish, 
What, what are you? No. He looks at you and he says, I love you, Derb. I love you. I love you with all my heart. I love you. You matter to me. Wendy, I love you with more than you can possibly imagine. I, I, I would do anything. I gave my life for you. And there's this glow, this, this beaming smile on the face of Jesus because he loves you. Bow your heads. Let me pray for you. Father, I, I cannot do justice. I don't even know how to begin to use words to describe the love you have for us. The human language, Lord, just is so inadequate at times to describe the indescribable, to explain the unexplainable. You love us so much, God. You sent your one and only son. And he suffered and he died so that we would not have to. And Jesus, you went to that cross, willingly chose that path because you love us, and because you want to be in relationship with us. And I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful, Jesus, for the love that I have from you in my heart, my life, and how it's changed me. And I just pray, Lord, for every person in this room or everyone watching online right now, if they've not yet experienced and known and tasted and seen how good the Lord's love is, that today would be the day. In fact, would you keep your head bowed and your eyes closed just for a minute? Maybe you're here today, or you're watching online, and you've not yet started your life as a Christ follower. It begins with a choice. It's always about choice. Will you choose to respond, to say yes, to surrender your life as he surrendered his life on the cross? Will you say, yes, God, I receive the gift of eternal life from Jesus. I receive the gift of his mercy and his forgiveness. I receive that personally. I take it. I embrace it. And I receive your love. And you, if you choose that, if you want to do that, then I'm going to make this very simple prayer. It's a simple prayer. But if this is what you want right now, just make these words your words. Make this your cry, from the, your heart cry to God. Jesus, thank you for loving me so much that you gave up everything, all of heaven. And you, in your life, your blood, you gave it up for me. And I get it. I see it. I respond today. I choose that love. And I choose to receive the gift, the grace, the mercy, the forgiveness that you offer to me. I say yes to you. I surrender my life to you, Jesus. As you surrendered your life to me, I, I surrender my life to you. And from this moment on, from this moment on, I say yes. Yes, I will follow you. Now, if that's you, that's your heart, desire, just in your own way, say, yeah, God, that's me. And here's the thing. That moment you do is that moment you become his child forever. In fact, there's already a party in heaven happening right now. The Bible says that the angels in heaven rejoice over one sinner who repents right now. There's a huge party happening. Thank you, Lord, for the people that are making that decision, for those that have made it already. All of us, so help us leave her today rejoicing in your love. I pray that in your amazing name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to finish with one last song. And I love this song because it's a great way to be reminded of how much God loves you. Let's worship and I'll come back.
What a great song to end on. Just a reminder of how great and awesome he is. And he loves you guys. And I love you too. Thanks for being a part of our service today, for being here and for putting up with me. And I uh, encourage you, if you began your life as a Christ follower, tell somebody and get baptized today. What a, what a radical idea. Repent and be baptized. You gave your heart to Jesus today. Go down to Post Falls, 20 minutes down the road, and get baptized. We'll be down there. We'll start eating about one or so whenever we get there and, and baptize at some point after that. We, we'll have plenty of time. But uh, also, if you uh, begin your life or today or recently, uh, on the tables and the baskets, there's a basket. Uh, it's got paper bags. It so begins this wonderful adventure. It's got a Bible and some material to get you started in your walk with Jesus. And on both sides of the room, com communion is always available by the candles if you'd like to take that. Next week, we finish up Revelation. I know it's Labor Day weekend, but if you're in town, I'm in town. And we're going to finish up the series and talk about the new heaven and new earth. It's going to be awesome. I love you guys. Hope to see you later or next week. God bless you. Thanks for being here.